command you because, um, you know, I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll go to a lar much larger churches and we'll have a Saturday morning leadership meeting. And I want to tell you, there's more people here than some of the leadership uh, of large churches. I want to thank you. Give yourself a hand. Come on. Give yourself a hand. I, I, I'm going to talk to you this morning. I'm going to go to the text in just a moment, but I, I want to give credit to what credit is due. Um, my wife on Wednesday night, she didn't preach. I did, but, she, but I can't say she didn't preach. She got up and preached. We, we, um, normally, when we show up to Tucson, she does the offering teaching, and although sometimes she asks me to do it, but normally she does when she's there. But our flight had been delayed out of Las Vegas an hour, and so we uh, we got there about 7:40, and they were they were taking the offering as we walked in, and then of course Meliana came up and she began to mention something out of the scripture, and it sparked something in my mind. It sparked it sparked this thought that began to thought God began to give me a download. Simply because I, I love hearing my wife preach. And especially when she brings out something from a different perspective that I've never saw before. And, and over the last couple of days since Wednesday, it's now Saturday, I couldn't get this out of my mind. And I was, I was wondering if I should share it this weekend. But then the Lord this morning in prayer said, I want you to release this word. Now, what I'm going to share with you, I've never shared before anywhere, is going online. In fact, I called my media guy this morning, and I said, I want this online on, on my platform and on our church, because I want every one of my leaders to hear this message that I'm going to preach here this morning. Now, ladies and gentlemen, everybody say windows. I'm not talking about Bill Gates. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm talking about we all have windows. Windows in life that we look through. And those windows are actually our perspective. And many times our perspective is not necessarily shaped by truth, it's shaped by experience. Many times our perspective is shaped by what we have walked through, what we, whether we have times of trauma or times of blessing. And it's imperative that we understand that about other people as well, that even though their perspective may be different than ours, I also have to do that they, they see through a lens of what they have experienced, suffered, their joys, their hopes, their desires. That's how they see the world. That's how they see others. That's how they see life. But let me give you a scenario because I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6 is actually one of the most, actually for me, as far as the book of 2 Samuel it's probably one of my favorite chapters because of the first part. Because it really shows David's heart for God's presence. It shows David's commitment for God's presence and his desire for God's presence because he understands, I cannot effectively lead this nation I can't effectively become a leader. I can't effectively have a spiritual awakening. I can't effectively be the man God's called me to do unless the presence of God is at the center of everything that I do. Are you hearing me? And even, I mean, I know that later on this afternoon, people are going to receive prophetic ministry. I know this is Word Alive Church. We have people in the sound booth. We have people, people serving our children, people serving on the platform. But at the center of everything that we do should be one thing. It's not taking the offering. 
It's not the center, the, the sermon, it's not, shouldn't be just the center of everything we do, that every com, comes into the climax of the sermon or the altar call. The center of everything we do should be the presence of God. The presence of God. Because without the presence of God, we would just have a religious service. We would just do religion. And fortunately, in America, we have focused more on filling the pews than filling the hall with God's presence. Come on. And I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I need the presence of God. I want the presence of God. The presence of God is, is a burning passion for King David. And he cannot, he cannot lead his nation properly without the presence of God where the previous administration, the previous king, Saul, he didn't care about the presence of God, more concerned about his own feelings and his own needs and own, own thoughts and because the ark of God was in captivity and then David went out to get the ark in the first part of 2 Samuel, and I won't go into detail. A man reaches out, and the cart gets killed, and, and David is kind of upset. So David leaves the ark of God, the presence of God, at a man's house by the name of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom and his family all of a sudden house the presence of God and over a 90-day period, God begins to bless Obed-Edom and his household. They have a 90-day revival. You know, you're hearing me. Well, David is in Jerusalem, and there's such a testimony that it, it hit, it, it's about what God's doing in the house of Obed-Edom that King David ears hear about it. And so now, now David wants to go bring back the ark because he doesn't want the presence of God and God's blessing to be limited to one family. He wants all the family of God and the entire nation to be blessed by God's presence. And so, like Meliana says, but he does something different that he didn't do the first time. Because how many in this room want God's presence to such a degree that every family and word of life gets blessed? Every visitor that gets blessed, every person that walks in this room gets blessed by the presence of God. Can I, can I, can I tell you something? Because we can have the best musicians. Can I, church, I've been to churches. They got professional musicians, but they don't have the presence of God. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? They, they've got, they got, they, they dim the lights and let the smoke out, but they don't got the presence of God. But you know why I keep coming up this mountain? For 27 years, we may not have the best lighting system. We may not have a sp smoke machine, but we've got the presence of God. And because we've got the presence of God, that's what's going to transform the lives of individuals. And so what David does, what David does, it's imperative that you hear what I'm going to tell you right now because I'm setting up for the narrative. However, if I want the presence of God, if you want the presence of God, if I want my church in Tucson to have the presence of God, something needs to happen. I have to make the necessary sacrifices because God's moved by sacrifice. We heard Meliana teach twice in the offering about the importance of sacrifice. And, and, and to the degree of my sacrifice is to the degree to the intensity of God's presence. Come on. And I'm at a, at a point, I'm 61 years old. I feel like I'm 21, but my wife reminds me of my bald spot. Come on. And, and, and my protruding lower half of my body. You know, you know what she did? I was laying down and she took a picture of my belly. Come on. And texted it to me. And I got so convicted, I lost 14 pounds. Come on. <laughs> yeah, she sent it to the kids. Pray for dad. <laughs> I 
I got a lot of problems. <laughs> Pray for me. But, but I don't know about you, but I'm 61 years old. I say, God, I want to make the necessary sacrifices. And your sacrifice and my sacrifice may look different, but we're all required to sacrifice something. But I've noticed something. People can sacrifice money, but they are not willing to sacrifice perspective. Let me, let me explain to that. Let me explain that, what that means. They can write a $1,000 check, but they can't change their mind about something because they've locked in to a perspective, a mindset, a type of thinking that they don't want to change. David understands I've got to make the necessary sacrifices to get the presence of God to the center of my nation from Obed-Edom's house to Jerusalem so my entire nation can enjoy God's blessing. Which means that he's not just making sacrifices for himself. He's making sacrifice for his nation. If you're a member of this church, let me just tell you what that means. That means that you're willing to make a sacrifice for every single member of the church. That, 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 that doesn't mean that I just belong to Word Alive or I belong to an Assembly of God church. I'm just using that as an example or, or that church that I belong to. If you go to another church and then you're a member of that church, you have to make, make sure that I'm making sacrifices not just for me but for every other member of that church. Are you, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what David was doing. I mean, it actually says that every six feet or so, every six paces, they would do a sacrifice. Come on. Every six feet, they would do a sacrifice. People don't even make a sacrifice every six months. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or every six years. You know what I'm saying? He's doing it every six feet. How long? I mean, it took me one, two, three, four, four seconds, you know, to walk about six feet. That means that every four seconds, come on, they're making a sacrifice. Because he wants the presence of God so bad in his city, I'm willing to make every, every, every four seconds, I'm going to give God an offering. I'm going to give God, I'm going to bless God. What do you think God's going to do? He's going to smile at that. Who does that? Well, He's setting precedents. He's creating a culture where now, now, now the entire nation is watching their king sacrifice. Which he means he's a different kind of king. I tell Meliana all the time, and I tell every, I'm, I'm telling the leaders of this church, and I'm telling leaders watching online, and I'm telling my leaders at the Citadel, let me just tell you, people are watching you. They're watching everything you do, how you act, how you talk, how you relate. But what happens if they all of a sudden saw you making sacrifices all the time? You know what they're going to do? Automatically, they're going to join you. Automatically, they're going to do what the leader does. They're going to participate in the sacrifice. So let me just tell you this. And that leads me to the text that I'm going to have you turn to in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 16, for many in this room, you've probably heard this story, but I'm going to preach it in a much different light than you've heard it. Because here's what's happening now. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, everybody say the ark of the Lord entering in the city of David. How many want the presence of God to enter into the city of Penn Valley? into the city of Grass Valley, into the city of Sacramento, into the city, into your home. Come on, enter in. The presence of God's coming in. Because a group of people have, not just David, a group of people have made, say, we're going to make the sacrifice so that God's presence enters into the city. 
That's what's happening. Now hear, hear this, because I want you to see this. It then says, people say M Michael, but I, it's McCall. But McCall, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. Turn to your neighbor and say, watched from a window. Say it again, watch from a window. Please don't forget what I'm going to speak right now. When you come to a worship service, are you watching or participating? Oh, come on. Are, uh, when you come to, to the house of God, are you watching or are you entering in? Because I've discovered something in my young life. I'm 21 in my mind, honey. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm 21. I lost 14 pounds in two weeks. And my mile time went one minute faster per mile. I'm proud of myself. I need to learn it was another 14 pounds in two weeks. She watched from a window. And when we're watching and not participating, we become judges. Because, listen, last night, my brother was waving the flags up here at the altar most of the night. In some churches, they would be watching him but not participating. And by them watching, they start complaining. And they judge them. And manipulating. And, and so they don't, they're not even aware that the presence of God is in the building because they're too busy watching. Oh, I mean. Because listen to this. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing, everybody say leaping and dancing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to forget this. I know the text doesn't say that, but why is David leaping and dancing, and why would he be leaping and dancing unless he was celebrating? Oh, because the, the, you guys don't know what happened last year in this church. Meliana had surgery. She had a surgery less than a week. It was Sunday night. It was our last night of, of our New Year's. Pastor George and the worship team, and if you were there that night, all of a sudden people started getting excited in the Holy Ghost. Come on. People were running and, jan and dancing and shouting and, and, and leaping. And you have to understand, Meliana was less than about a week of surgery. Well, what they did is they tied a, put, uh, they, they, they sewed a tube to her side with a little ball at the end to drain the fluid out of her body. Well, she had that under her, her, her dress that she was wearing. But then the Holy Ghost showed up. I'm, stand, I'm standing right there, she, and then she starts taking off with all of you guys. And she is running, and she forgot she had that thing tied, right? Now, I'm not worried about Meliana. I'm worried about you guys. Come on. Because I've been around you for 27 years, and I know that it could turn into a mosh pit really quickly. <laughs> not intentionally, but you know. God really moved. I got a black eye. Come on. <laughs> you know, and, and so, so 
I'm I'm keeping my eye on her until I, in case I have to make a beeline in case somebody accidentally bangs her. You know, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm worried. So she's running around. She's over here and she run around the church, and all of a sudden, the whole tube and the bottle fall off. And I see her run in the bathroom, grab the tube, and you know she comes back in, and we go back to Pastor Sandra and Mike's house. Well, this Sunday night, we're not leaving to Tucson to Tuesday, and she has an open wound stitched, you know, they stitched it in her side, in her body. And we took, I took her shirt off. I took her shirt off. I looked at there. There was no scar. There was no sign that a tube had been there. There was brand new, perfect skin. She got instantaneously healed. Oh, come on and give God a shout of praise right now. Give God a shout of praise. Give God a shout of praise. Is there a leap? Is there a dance? Come on. Is there a shout? Oh, Jesus. On Tuesday, when we get back, she had a doctor's appointment. And the doctor said, Mrs. Harkey, where's the bottle? I'm trying to... Well, she can't, she can't say, I went to this church up in these hills with these hillbillies, and they, and they started leaping and dancing in the spirit, you know, and it fell off. She can't tell the doc, what? And they don't even know what you're talking about. And she goes, Mrs. Harkey, it's healed perfectly. Oh, come on. Leaping and dancing. You know, she forgot she had, had just had surgery. I mean, that's a, I was eyewitness to it. That's why they say, you know, you may get healed by in praise and worship, you know. People say, oh, that's just the flesh. Well, you don't tell me that because I witnessed it in my own life, my own wife. So if David's leaping and dancing, how many other people are leaping, leaping and dancing? Because there's a celebration going on in Jerusalem where now something that has not been in Jerusalem, the presence of God, the power of God, the glory of God, the movement of God is now back where it's supposed to be. The center, come on, of the nation. The center of God's people. And so David is not the only one leaping and dancing. But where's McCall's window, Maliana? It's not on the celebration. What happens when you and I complain? When you and I complain, usually I found this out, the complainers don't participate. Complainers judge. Because complainers don't know how to celebrate. If there's something that God wants to teach us this morning, and teach us in life, I want to teach you how to celebrate. Because I have a God that healed my wife right here, right over there, right over there by where Steve is sitting, where healed her completely with no with the open wound and put brand new skin in this church. Come on, because she's decided to celebrate. I don't know about you, but I want to celebrate. I don't want to watch... I want to celebrate. So she she then watches and it says dancing before the Lord. And it says, and she despised him in her heart. Let me stop right there. 
because I want to explore this in a moment. I have a few moments. And I'm going to try to get you out before noon, which I will. Um, but I want to say this. But yet, I'm also realized that perspective happens, as I said earlier, based on experience. Because let me give you a little backstory of McCall. McCall, the daughter of Saul. And when David killed Goliath, as a reward, Saul gives McCall to David. But, you know, here's the interesting thing. McCall loved David. So what happened? What happened to McCall? What happened, McCall, Meliana, between that season of her life where she literally loved David and now she despises him? Come on. What happened? What happened with people who loved Word of Life? Oh, come on. That love coming here. That love the pastors. That, that love participating. That love serving on the worship team. Or love serving. What happened to them that, they, that, that now they despise it? What happens to people? And I'm using this church as an example, but it happens all over the country. I mean, what happened to her perspective, Pastor Mike? What happened to her view? What happened to the genuine love and affection she has for her husband and his heart and what he does, the warrior, worshiper, king? What happened in, that now she despises him? Church, can I tell you something? I don't want to be in a relationship and years later I despise my wife. I don't want to be in a relationship years later I despise my pastor. I don't want to be in a relationship where years later I despise the very church. Come on. And I end up despising God. Come on. What happened to him? What happened to her? So I have to ask these questions because I have to ask these questions because then I have to get in the mind of McCall, the psychology of McCall of, because she didn't start off that way. She started off pure. In fact, McCall loved David so much that in 1 Samuel, I believe, chapter 18 or 19, I think it's 18, that after, after Saul's jealousy and thinks that David is a threat to his kingdom, he gets it in his mind to kill his his son-in-law, King David, McCall's husband, McCall finds out about it and, and orchestrates an escape out the window. Window. Ever say window? But then years later, that same window, she despises him. The same window that she saved him, years later, she now despises him. She saved his life because she found out a plot that her father had, had orchestrated that he's going to come in the middle of the night and have his soldiers murder David. Not only does she let David know and help him escape out the window, but then she makes a fake mannequin, covers, covers it with bed with straw, and when the soldiers come in and stab, 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 and to kill, they open up, and there's no person. McCall did that. McCall rescued David. Now, years later, she gets, how could someone turn, how could someone turn so, uh, so, so much, I mean, one pendulum swing over to the other? They, they love, but now they despise. How could that happen? And ladies and gentlemen, I want to I wanna, I wanna warn you, it can happen to me. It can happen to you. So subtly that we don't even realize it. That we don't even realize that we're that, that these kinds of things are growing up on the inside of our soul, and it's affecting our perspective and how we see the people, you know, and how we, I mean, th th this th this grieves me that we've got to a country that instead of in loving America, we burn the flag. That grieves me. That how could you despise the nation that has given you so many opportunities and freedoms? 
Come on, you know, you know what I'm saying? How can you despise this country that, that you, you, you wake up, you, 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 you can go to any restaurant, you can, you can go down to Sacramento, you can eat Indian food on Tuesday, Mexican food on Wednesday, Italian food on Friday, and, and you're still not happy. Come on. You can drive your Porsche. You can go down and buy a brand new Lexus, and, and you're still not happy. You, you, you're a queen of a nation, and you're despising. Oh, God. How does that happen to the soul? How does that happen to a human being that once was so pure and once rescued her own husband? I would hate that after 40 years of marriage that my wife would despise me. I would hate that she despised me because I was up in the front leaping and dancing. Come on, worshiping God. Not sinning. I'm not cheating on her. I'm not committing adultery. I, 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 I'm not doing evil. I'm actually worshiping God. But before I throw McCall under the bus, I see McCall as a victim. Because ladies and gentlemen, sometimes what people have gone through shapes the very way they view life. One thing that I've learned, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn more, that since these last three years, Meliana, I've learned that people's perspective are primarily shaped not by what God says, but by what they have experienced. You know what? I'm going to tell you something about McCall. Her perspective wasn't just shaped from a window. It was shaped by a father. It was shaped by a father. Because, Meliana, I don't think that we ever see in Scripture, and I can show it to you, I can prove it to you, we never in, see in Scripture uh, Saul leaping and dancing. Oh, come on. We never see him lifting his hand. We never see him singing. We never see him worshiping. And that, she, that means that she never saw a king worship. Oh, come on. Leaders, let people see you worship. Kings and queens in this church, because I'm speaking to kings and queens. You're a king and you're a queen. Let them see. Let your kids see you worship. Let your grandkids see you worship. Let people see you worship. Don't sit there on your iPhone looking at your boyfriend. Come on. Begin to get in the house of the Lord. Leap and dance so everybody can see you worship. Are you hearing me? Because it shapes the perspective of a generation. But I can tell you why I believe that McCall, I mean, I mean, that word despised, that means he, she, Meliana, it means what she saw David do was vile. That's what that means. What you are doing is vile. I don't see the presence of God. I see what you are doing is vile to my perspective. It's a strong word. And, but, I want to take a step back. Because when McCall had rescued David, her father did something to her. When David was a fugitive for seven years, McCall was given to another man. Can you imagine how McCall felt? The man that I loved, you wanted to kill. And then you just pawned me off to somebody else. You don't treat me like a human being. 
No wonder her perspective was wrong. And it's something that we have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that we are a prophetic church and we are prophetic people. And part of our responsibility is to change the perspective of a generation. Part of our response, that's part of our assignment. You know, one of my core values, I have three core values at our church, and one of the core values is we are a prophetic church because I want to change the, prof- uh, the perspective of the city of Tucson, perspective of that neighborhood. I want to change that perspective because we've got people's perspective shaped by their trauma. Can you imagine? Put, put yourself in McCall. See, because here's what we do. We're, we're quick to judge M- McCall. And obviously, I'm not endorsing what she did. But I understand that some of her perspective was not her own doing. That I, I sort of, I have, to, I have to tell you, I understand that you and I have free will and a free choice. I'll get into that later. But at the same time, I have empathy for McCall because I didn't get pushed into a relationship with somebody I didn't love. Come on. And because of culture and pressure and all this too, the very man that I loved, you wanted to kill. And then you then you pawned me off like a piece of like a piece of trash or uh, just something that can go something that has no value you don't show any value to me and you give me to another man well ladies and gentlemen let me just tell you this when david became king one of the first things that he did was to tell general abner it's in it's in second samuel 3 Go and get McCall, my wife, back. Come on. Go and get her back. And then, so what they did is they they actually, this other man, this, this second husband, is now a victim, too. Well, they went and they got McCall back to bring McCall back to David. Because David wanted her. And it even says in 2 Samuel chapter 3 that the man wept as his wife was leaving. And then we're wondering why. Why? McCall's looking through the wrong window. But I want to tell you something. I want to say something. Her perspective was not shaped by presence. It was shaped by trauma. You follow what I'm saying? Church, let me just tell you, that's why I love the power of the prophetic. That's why I love the power of the prophetic. The prophetic word can potentially extract the trauma out of you. It it shows that God knows my trauma. He knows my pain. He knows what I walk through. He speaks to me, and then he extracts it out of me to change my perspective. So rather than judging, I'm now participating in what he's doing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Oh, hear me. Hear me. How many believe that God's raised up, word of life, raised you up to change the perspective of a nation? Yet, yet I want to say something. Even though that I believe that that is very true in the life of McCall, I also want to tell you this. Her complaining crippled her. It crippled her that she complains, because we'll see this. You know, they, she, 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 she's carrying this in the heart. She, she never steps down from that window. She never goes down to join her husband. She never goes down to join. She's the queen of a nation. She never participates in what the people are doing. And after David gives the sacrifice, 
It says in verse 20 that when David returned home to do what? Bless his household. I'm going to bless my God, then I'm going to bless my household. That's why the biggest hypocrite is someone who comes to church and blesses God and curses their household. Oh, come on. That's duplicity. He, comes to, he went to church and blessed, blessed the presence of God, gave the sacrifice, went back home. I'm going to bless my house. Come on. Well, I'm going to bless my wife. I'm going to bless my kids. I'm going to bless my family. That's what I'm going to do. Come on. When David returned home to bless his household, listen to this. Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. Hear me. Please don't forget what I'm going to tell you, and you can thank my wife. When I don't participate in what God is doing within the context of the local body, I become a critic of that body. And I'm here to tell you, and I'm going to call it out, that the spirit of criticism makes the body barren. And if I, per, because you know what, I, what, 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 can, what, what can happen to me? It can happen to me, and I have to guard my heart. Telling George a proverb, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And I have to guard my heart because sometimes we don't know the difference between venting and criticism. You follow what I'm saying? Now, please hear me what I'm going to tell you right now. It's healthy for you to vent. You need to be able to have people and leader, a pastor, uh, 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 where, where, where you can come with your concern and you can vent and let your feeling out. But the difference between venting and criticism is that venting lets it out and then vent venting wants to be a part of the solution. You, you follow me? Criticism never stops. And it doesn't want to be a part of the solution. That's the difference. Come on. It, 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 in the contents of marriage, you, it, you, in order for a healthy marriage to happen, you have to give permission of that spouse to vent. Come on. Are you hearing me? You have to. In order for it to be healthy, you have to. But, but, but at when they let it out, then what you do is then you look for a solution to the situation. Come on. Because if all you do is complain to your spouse about their behavior, it's only going to create anger, and it's only going to create I'm despising him and resenting him and resenting her, and it's not the marriage, the relationship is not going to last. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, McCall is not venting. She's complaining. You're half naked. You're, she's mocking her husband. You're a king. Kings don't act like that. Kings don't worship. Kings don't do that. Don't you know how to behave? And, 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 then, she's, and then she's making some sexual connotations because the slave girl, like some vulgar fellow, he, he, basically you're a cheater, an adulterer. That's where the word vulgar, you're, there's some sexual con. She's accusing him of adultery. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, she's making accusations about his character that is untrue. That's what complainers do. Can I tell you something right now? I'm going to declare war on complaining. 
I, I can tell you, we cannot have, could it be that God's, God's blessing, God's, the revival that God wants to send into America is because the American church is complaining more than they're praising. Oh, come on. We got too many McCalls and not enough Davids. Now, now, I don't want you, because I have to be careful because when someone's complaining to me, sometimes I can get sucked into it too. My perspective about that person changes. And so now I believe a lie about that individual because we know that what McCall complained about David's dancing was an absolute lie because we read the text, he was dancing before the Lord. Not before, not before girls half naked. Are you, you, know, you follow what I'm saying? But she made a sexual connotation and projected a judgment and assessment about the man of God. Now, now ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm not a Trump follower. I'm not a Biden follower. I'm a Bible follower. Because my problem with both sides is Meliana showed me. Meliana, I didn't watch, I didn't watch the debate. But one side needs major help. <laughs> the other side never answered one question and just complained about the opponent. And that's the person that's going to lead our country? Come on. And I want to tell you something, what happened. Meliana was watching, she wouldn't watch it live, she was watching it on the YouTube, on, on the plane, and she gave me her earpiece and stuck it in. I let, let asked about 10 seconds, I, I don't want to hear it. But we were flying to Idaho. And we were doing a conference on Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night for a group of Spanish churches. But on Saturday, the church that I go to every year, it's a large church, about seven, 800, outside of Boise, they were celebrating the 70th anniversary of the founding pastors. 70 years together. Wedding anniversary. Right? There was 500 people at the celebration. The son paid for the entire meal in the gymnasium. And, and we, because we were there, the family was so excited that we were there, and they said, please sit up front, sit with us, and, and everything, because we go to their church every year. And it's just the way our, the way our schedule allowed our, us to be there. And here, the day before, we, had here, we, we saw a debauchery. People despise one another. No honor. Divisiveness and hatred towards each other. How are we going to bring the country together? And then we go to the house of God. And they're celebrating, they're honoring, they're showing respect for someone who for 70 years planted four churches and built the 800-seat sanctuary that he's standing in. He's now 93 years old, and they've been married for 70 years, and they're still talking, they still got their mind, they're still preaching, they're not, they're not, they're not pastoring the daughter and son-in-law are pastoring the church they built. And everything that came out of the grandkids' mouth and all all the people was honor. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? I pray that word alive will become like that. That everything that will come, because these two, this one, founded the church. Because you know what? We get old. But we never get too old to honor. Come on. What I see here in the story of McCall is regardless of your trauma, regardless of you not liking what your husband did, you can, you're, you're entitled to your opinion. You're, you're even given permission to have your own perspective, even when I don't agree with your perspective, but you're not given permission to dishonor. 
Oh, come on. You follow what I'm saying. And I found out that complainers don't honor. They don't honor. They don't honor. I mean, I literally, I mean, I, the grandkids, who, two of the grandsons, that they, they have, the, the, the couple had three children, all in ministry. Most of the family pastors, very successful, very successful in business. One daughter is, is, is the biggest realtor in the Boise Treasure Valley area. She owns hundreds of businesses. She's a millionaire. The other daughter is the, uh, the, the pastor and her husband. The, 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 the son is a wealthy businessman in Texas. And, and they're walking up, and all they're doing is honoring their and I just sat there with my jaw dropped, and I said, you know what? And Meliana brought it out, that, you know what? Shouldn't the church be leading the way? Because the world doesn't know how to act. The world doesn't know how to honor. The world knows how to despise. The world knows how to complain, but they don't know how to honor and could it be sometimes the church, sometimes the church, every church goes through transition. Every church goes through seasons of difficulty. Every church goes through challenges that are hard to navigate through in the context of the church. But every church, God's trying to teach us to honor. Because if we can honor in here, we can teach them how to honor out there. Can I hear an amen right now? So she asked, he comes home, Melian, he came home to bless his family and she dishonors him. So David, I'm going to start wrapping this up. David said to McCall, it was before the Lord who choose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler and Lord over... And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will celebrate. Everybody say, I will celebrate before the Lord. I wish we would be that committed to celebrating that even we're attacked, that we don't get sucked into that spirit of complaining, yeah. that we can maintain a heart to celebrate yeah. before God. Yeah. Because there's all, I mean, let me just tell you, let me just tell you, every single church, you go from the parking lot into the foyer, and sometimes when you go into the foyer, you're hit by complaining. I'm telling you. Before the music started, and then you're wondering, how am I going to to celebrate after I just heard this? That's where you have to learn to let it go in one year and out the other, and I'm not going to let you steal my joy. I'm not going to let you steal my praise. I'm not going to let you steal my leaping and my dancing. Come on. I'm not going to let you steal my shout. And we, you know, people have preached this much better than I can. But listen to this. I will become even more undignified than this. You know what I'll do? I'll wear shorts on a Saturday morning and lead worship. I'm not wearing shorts tomorrow. I'm guaranteeing you. You will never see me in shorts in this building. Come on. But I don't care if somebody, you know, I don't care if somebody wears shorts. I, I don't care about stuff like that. All I care about is the presence of God. Listen, and I will be, I will be, listen, I, I, you know, most people hone on the undignified part, but we forget this second part sometimes. Listen to what it says, Meliana. I will be, and I'm reading the NIV, I will be humiliated even in my own eyes. What? You know what he's saying? I'll be persecuted. Before my own house. But I don't care about being persecuted. I care about the presence. 
And if I have the presence in my nation, I'll put up with the persecution. Because the persecution comes from your own house. Well, come on. That's where persecution comes. What does that mean? We think we get persecuted out in the world, but actually the persecution comes from their own house. It comes from the church. It comes from people in church. It comes from within. It comes within the context of marriage. If you can't handle the persecution, how are you going to handle the praise? How, how, if you can't handle the persecution, how can you handle the weight of glory? If persecution cripples your praise, how can you ask God for a greater anointing? I will be more humiliated in my own eyes, but these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And I'll close with this. And McCall, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Which means, obviously, I have empathy for McCall. Obviously, Melian, I, I see the trauma. I see how, how she grew up. I, I see how she started out right. And, and I see how some things in life shaped her perspective. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, I'm responsible I can't let my traumatic experiences be the crutch or the excuse for me not being responsible for my perspective. Are you hearing me? And how, how, how could she have transformed her perspective? How can you and I transform our perspective? If our perspective is skewed or, or filtered through the window of our trauma, how do we do that? This is exactly what you do. You participate in what the Lord is doing. You, you, you intentionally make it your effort. Oh, that, well, I, you don't say, well, that's not my personality. Oh, I'm not like that. I, I, I'm, not very, uh, I'm not very talkative. I, I, I don't worship that way. I don't, well, you do that at the football game. Uh, you, if your grandson ran the, for the touchdown, ran for a touchdown, made an interception, in the, and the team won the game, you're going to be celebrating. Come on. Because <laughs> he's a part of you. And you know that. You know, I'm my grandson, I watched one play. Ezekiel John Gabriel Harkey got in. He's a third string defensive back. He plays football for the school. He uh, pads and everything. I didn't know 11 year old wore pads, but they do. In Tennessee, they let them wear pads, and, and, and in California, they wear dresses. I don't know why, but, you know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I'm so sorry. I hope you heard that. I hope you heard that, brother. <laughs> You know, he kind of, we, 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 we were so thankful. We, we came, we, we, we come in the football game, and we're watching the football game, and my, my grandson's coming in, and he, he come in, they call him in late, and first, first play, you know, he, uh, the, the, the wide receiver on the other team is waving at the quarterback because Ezekiel hasn't got, got in this position, and the quarterback hikes the ball, throws the bomb, and the other team gets the touchdown, you know. That was Ezekiel's play. And he'd come back. I said, what happened, brother? <laughs> Then I almost caught him, Grandpa. He was 30 yards from him, you know. We weren't celebrating you know, that day. We were, we, were, we were laughing, but we weren't celebrating. But had he caught that ball, had he caught that ball and intercepted and ran it back for a touchdown, Grandma and Grandpa would be on the field. Come on. We'd have leaped over the fence. Uh, we'd have leaped over the fence, and we would have ran on that field and grabbed our 11-year-old, he's 12 now, our 11-year-old grandson, and we would have hugged him, and I could imagine what Grandma would have bought him. Go to the video store, buy whatever you want. Come on. But yet we won't celebrate. 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Celebration is a free will choice. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to celebrate because why? I'm not going to be barren. I'm going to declare war on complaining so that I don't become barren. Because I want the days of barrenness to be over. I want to declare war on spiritual, emotional, financial barrenness right now. I am going to get the money from my fence. <laughs> I am going to get the money from my remodel. I am going, the money is going to come in. I don't know how, but I'm going to call it in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not going to let barrenness define my life. I'm not going to let my past trauma define my life. I'm certainly not going to let my wife's cancer define our life. You know why? Because she's completely whole now. There's no trace of cancer. She has no cancer in her body. They can't find it. They even, look, they even sent them over the house to look for it. Come on. They were looking everywhere for it. They looked under a car seat. Come on. Where you sat, they looked everywhere. They, they, looked, they looked under her pillow. Come on, they looked everywhere. The, the biopsies, that, why do you think it cost a million dollars? The last time I checked, it was 600000 I said, well, I, I wasn't worried about it either. You know why I wasn't worried? Because I'm a tither and I'm a giver. I, I'm not worried about God, you're going to take care of it. Because let me just tell you, how much, how much is my wife's healing worth? And if they didn't pay the bill, I would stand up here, here not even worried about it. You know why? Because I know God makes a way where there is no way. I'm not going to, I, I, I'm still going to celebrate. Whether I got a million dollar medical bill hanging over my head or not, I'm still going to celebrate. That's where he says, I'm going to become more undignified than this. What do you want me to be depressed? What do you want me to be? Uh oh, happy? Want me to go, go and beg? You want me to go get a job? You want me to go out and do a GoFundMe? Come on, because I'm going through something. No, no, no. I'm going to celebrate. Is there anybody in the house that says, I'm ready to celebrate? You want to break barrenness off your life? Stand up and celebrate. Stand up and celebrate. Stand up and celebrate. Do I got anybody that knows how to celebrate? Do I got any know how to celebrate? Because when I celebrate, when I celebrate, I have a different perspective. That doesn't mean my problems go away. That doesn't mean that they're not there. That doesn't mean the bill's not there. Just because I'm dancing and standing and shouting with this crazy prophet on a Saturday morning, it doesn't mean that I don't still have the same issues, but now I have a different perspective. And because I'm a prophetic person, my perspective is, is different, and now I'm prophesying what I'm believing God's going to do. I'm not barren. My church is not barren. My bank account is not barren. My household is not barren. My wife is not barren. When, when she is up there and, and telling, telling everybody, my kids cost $2 a piece. I was thinking on mine, I should have had more kids. <laughs> I could have five kids for 10 bucks. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? I could have populated the earth with more responsibility, more people of responsibility. I said, oh, no, why did I only have two? But it's not too late. Because now I get to have spiritual kids. Now I got to have the spiritual sons and daughters. I got a spiritual daughter in Fresno, California, who's blowing it up. Blowing it up, man. She's crushing it. She's her church is in revival, full blown revival. Knowing her since she is four years old, and she's an amazing young lady. And she joined CI. She was the youngest CI minister ever, eighteen years old. Yeah, 
You know where she got introduced in the prophetic? Under our ministry, she got introduced into the prophetic. Never heard a prophetic word in her life. I've been prophesying. She's 30-something now. I've been prophesying over her every year since she was four years old. Wow. Just let me just tell you, man, well, I'm not going to be barren. But the moment, the moment, the moment I get critical, come on, the moment I criticize, the moment I have a wrong perspective, my, my barrenness happens. That's why I'm going to celebrate. Yeah.